Welcome back. Part two, authorial choice in Margin Satrapies, Persepolis. Yeah, we talked about all this stuff, but I forgot to mention one thing. So she wrote Persepolis in 2002, which is great, uh, but her career is ongoing. Uh, as recently as 2019, she directed a movie called Radioactive, which is about the life of Mary Curie, which is not surprising that she would direct that movie. Um, she was nominated for an Oscar for the movie version of The Complete Persepolis. Um, so she's very much still producing art, very much still an awesome thinker. 14 images. I'll go back to 13 because I'm close to it. Uh, point of view. So point of view in images is like, uh, where's the camera? Where's the camera for this one, for this one, for this one, for this one? So for each one, you'd say like, where's the camera positioned? Is it below? Is it above? That's where you think about things like, it seems like this guy's floating. He seems higher. seems up above. Now there's a close-up. This shot right here is a very interesting point of view where you can see Marjean's mom through the mirror. So these are complex layers of meaning that operate uh, at the level of the image. Speaking of complexities, here she is with a complex and interesting narrative technique. At this point, she has, uh, mm, I don't know, I guess created an expectation that your narration is in the box and that here uh, is interaction between the characters and dialogue. She swaps it up right here with this very clear image of young Margie saying, and that was that, which is really uh, breaking the fourth wall uh, to have Margie, who is supposed to be a character, act as a narrator. I, I would say that that's kind of like she's flexing her muscles a little bit and showing how powerful this narrator uh, can be because all of the reality that's depicted visually is um, under her control, which is pretty cool. Um, so speaking about images, she frequently blends, and this is one of the most powerful, frequent authorial choices. Almost every page has like these, I call them abstract images, you know? So this, for example, here we have a realistic depiction of her mother looking at herself in the mirror. Did this actually happen? I don't know, it's memoir. So this, so there's, you know, was Mar how, how does Margie know? Was she standing behind her and she kind of snuck up and saw her looking at herself in the mirror with this expression on her face? Probably not, but it's something that's realistic. It's something that could very well have happened. Same thing with this one, this one, this one, you know, all of these. But then we have this image right here, which is really abstract. You know, it's really designed to give the feeling, you know, at no point was her mother surrounded by disembodied heads of fundamentalist leaders or the fundamentalist you know, secret police or something like that. Um, so it's an abstract image that uh, is designed to convey um, some kind of realistic events, but like she does that a lot and it's part of the work uh, that we encounter making meaning from this is determining when she's doing what. So sometimes an even more abstract set of images right here in that this is what I call an imaginative sequence. So she has over her head there a visual metaphor or a symbol. And that's kind of can be, I don't wanna say it's confusing, but it's just a level of complexity and interpretation. Is it a visual metaphor or is it a symbol? Is it a visual metaphor or is it a symbol? So um, a metaphor, you know, is when two things are, are brought together um, and one becomes the other, you know. Um, here we have a possible symbol in that this ruler is kind of a symbol for that it works with in conjunction with the narration that the ruler might be a symbol for this modern and avant-garde style of her family, whereas here we might have uh, the uh, the figuration and the art as a symbol for the 
Persian, ancient Persian influence or Islam in general. Um, but what about this? Is this a metaphor? Is it a symbol? Well, it's a sun. And so sometimes if you're saying, is it a metaphor or a symbol, you have to ask like a ruler. Mm, what is a ruler? What does a ruler do? You have to dig into um, the representation and, and, and what it might mean. Um, a ruler, yeah, there's, there's possible uh, metaphoric or symbolic meanings that have to do with a ruler. Um, but, but we only see it once, you know, whereas this is a little bit more persistent, this sun. And then we look in other places and we see, well, where do we have fire? Okay, sun, huh. So maybe there's something more going on. Maybe it's not um, as simple uh, as a metaphor. Maybe it's a little bit more persistent as a symbol. So then we have to say things like, what is the sun? What is light? What does light mean? And this is the same way that, you know, in Shakespeare, he'll talk about light and dark, and all of a sudden, you, you know, all, all these uh, thoughts and feelings and moments are associated with light and dark, and it just becomes part of the way that the meaning is layered and, and brought together. Um, Satrapi does things like that visually. And so what does it mean that they're jumping over fire here? What does it mean that the fire is represented again in this image with the candle? Well, that's your, you know, that's your thing to think about as you're interpreting. I just want you to know that there's a language that's used. So sometimes we talk about visual metaphors, sometimes we talk about symbols, and that determining which is which uh, is, you know, you make choices in doing that. So that's number 18, and that's number 19. And... Uh, where I started was symbolic, abstract, imaginative sequence. So sometimes you'll have a sequence of images, and if you're going to analyze this and talk about, you know, this image, it would make sense to say, well, this image falls in a sequence of images in which Marjean is depicted uh, in an abstract or symbolic fashion with a uh, sun as her face, which is also reflected on the other page with the sun in the corner or her family jumping over the fire. Those are the kind of things that you're getting into for where you're where you're seeing the meaning, where you're seeing the value in what uh, Miss Satrapi has constructed for us. Let's see, where do we go? Yeah, we'll go 20 now. Allusions are frequently used, and they start right here with an allusion to Zoroastrianism, which is a very interesting religion. I always like to talk, when I think about Zoroastrianism, I know it's a very rich, a very old set of beliefs that predate uh, Islam in the country of Iran. Islam, interestingly, of our um, of the three large monotheistic religions in the world, um, is the youngest. Um, it, was, it was before this, this is the Persian, this is the conquest of uh, the Persian Empire where the Zoroastrianism was replaced with Islam. Um, so in any case, sometimes there's just a visual representation. Uh, sometimes they'll, she'll mention the name uh, but we'll see more of those figures on the next page. Here we have uh, a juxtaposition, where these two images are right next to each other, but there's definitely a, um, dialogue or uh, something between the two images, where this is her imaginative idea of her family that might be a little bit closer to uh, some of those Zoroastrian beliefs. Maybe. I mean, this is, you know, this is my interpretation and speculation, so I can't say that it's like what she intended. I'm talking about the work as I'm inter as I'm reading it. Um, so, uh, you know, that she saw things this way, but in reality, they were this way. And so it's a juxtaposition. Um, and it lets us, it gives us some insight into her character, into her family dynamics. Um, and that is number 22. Number 23, looks like it's right here. Uh, characterization in relationships. And so we can start to say how are characters built, how are uh, traits revealed, how are relationships revealed and sustained, and are there visual aspects to this? So when we see the depiction of her grandmother and all these images, what is there that is significant in these images in the way that the image is composed, the relationship between the narration and the dialogue? Um, and then the third one is that here we have a technique we haven't seen elsewhere. This is a three-panel dialogue. Um, you could call it a short anecdote. So, you know, as she moves through the novel, uh, the memoir, you know, at different times, she's depicting events symbolically. Sometimes she's moving quickly so that you understand um, an atmosphere or environment or things that were happening. Um, and then sometimes we get to, this is a moment. 
you know? And a lot of times we'll call that um, an anecdote, you know? So you could call this a, a, a sequence of images, three images that, that uh, depict a short anecdote and the relationship between Marjean and her grandmother. Um, so the structure is that we have three panels with a shared or unified narration. So this is just the language that we use, but you see this narration right here stretches this to these, which we read one, two, three. Just a different technique and the language that we use to define it. That's kind of what it's all about. It's what I'm working on here. Uh, here we have number 25 something that we haven't seen before. We have a symbolic or imaginative character. So this is her depiction of God. Is this the God of Islam? Is it her own personal God in this moment? Or is this the God of Zoroastrianism? Uh, I don't know. I don't know clearly. Um, but we know that this is her depiction of her early yearning, her early longing to, uh, to be a prophet and to be an important uh, person uh, with respect to religion. Here we have position, center, dominant position. She is in uh, very much not the dominant role here. And she's embarrassed, reaction. So, uh, I wonder what's, oh, here we go. And then we have uh, number 26. We have visual characterization. So, here we have a sequence of images, and this one particularly, she's centered in the sequence of images, which depict, you see, these three images right here are her parents, and then in the next sequence, the teacher, the disapproving teacher, has been replaced with Marjean herself, and there she is, centered in the image and in this three-panel sequence of images. It's a close-up. Her parents are cropped out, so it really focuses on her, and... <laughs> I didn't finish the word here, but she lies, you know? So that's that's powerful characterization. And you can see how the visual aspects of that characterization let us know that this is an important moment. This is this is an important insight uh, for who Mar Margie, you know, Margie the character, who she is. And so at this point, uh, we have developed a little bit of a relationship with that narrative voice. And so, uh, the narrative voice, um, you know, and I have just highlighted here, just so you can see, we're st we've, we've, now we've heard a lot from this narrative voice, this Margie from the future. Um, this is the voice. This is the consciousness that structures uh, the sequences of images and that moves the reader from symbolic to realistic representations of the past. You know, this is a very powerful voice that can take us from you know, one moment, here she is having a, an imagined conversation um, with God to depict her early attachment to religion. Here we have kind of like a symbolic representation of what she valued at that age. Um, and we recognize it's kind of a unique thing about this, and I, I think it kind of might generate some of the feelings. People have strong reactions to this, is that we know that this voice that's guiding us through all of this is this little girl. You know, this little girl, as she uh, has uh, grown, matured, and gone through a lot of stuff. Here's a representation of some of the things I was talking about. Um, here we are, new chapter. So chapter headings, this is another choice. I'm not, I didn't even uh, annotate this one. Uh, but here, let's, this position, here she's doing that thing again where she breaks the fourth wall and the narrative control is given <laughs> to the character, little Margie. And so this, I think this builds our relationship with Margie. I think it's a very powerful technique and very effective. Um, my faith was not unshakable. You know, it feels like she's so directly talking to us and then we see her interacting again. And we recognize there's a huge difference between this Margie right here and this one right here. Uh, this one is empowered with that voice of the future. Um, so very self-conscious, you know, breaking the fourth wall is always self-conscious. It's when you recognize the art form itself is saying, I know I'm not real. You're having, you know, that's, it's very powerful. Um, so that older Satrapi here, what does she do? She's, she's guiding us back and forth. 
between figurative representation to literal representation to an exploration of a thought or a feeling to a little representation to a literal to a symbolic representation of literal events to things that didn't in fact happen and uh and it's very powerful i feel um and so we have this figurative and imaginative reality here that's all this is all this stuff is you know did she play war with her friends probably but like this image right here is pure abstract um, metaphor, a visual metaphor, and here a verbal metaphor for the revolution. Obviously, it wasn't just a simple process. And then here we have um, abstract representations of 2,500 years of history, uh, but we also have at the same time, oh, this is important here, especially because it's so effective right here, is we have, uh, we have literal figurative, imaginative, uh, happening at the same time because this is quotations from her father. My father said, this are his fa her father's quotations that she is then um, transforming into these abstract visualizations, which is very effective. Moving along, we have structure, something about structure here. We have panel position, top left, like the topic sentence. You know, this this is like the topic sentence or main idea, and this is about her growth as a as a thinker, as an intellectual, as a very very young intellectual. So this is a powerful position. Here we don't have that center position, but here we certainly do, and it's double wide, and it's a very very important dynamic between these two characters, these two imaginative characters. She didn't, uh... and then we have more allusions, so more allusions to. Uh, philosophers, politics, people who are important in religion or revolution there. So at this point, we've developed this relationship with uh, what, who seems to be a very sensitive, imaginative, intelligent, independent-minded, and probably maybe most important, likable child. And so what will happen, this is, remember, this is all imaginative here. Really, this is, you know, these conversations didn't happen there. They, maybe they happened in her mind, you know, while she was thinking here in bed and reading. They were happening. And we get to this page. Here we have, you know, she's trying to continue her relationship with, uh, with God. But then she hears something. Look at this. No narration. Is this the first panel that has had no narration? It's just us. And so this, for the first time, we have to make the meaning from this. She's heard something. Look at her. Where is she positioned? So she can hear her parents in the other room as they talk. Visual foreshadowing. She uses this elsewhere, but why is there a bush here that looks a lot like an explosion? I don't know. Why would she put that there? It's a choice. And then here's reality. So we have this girl with this vivid imagination, and she's, she's troubled with, should I become a prophet? Can I become a prophet? Well, what happens when her world turns completely upside down. And so here we have images that are very, very powerful, but they're like symbolic or abstract depictions of actual events. So center position, very powerful, abstract layers. And then finally this, and this I think is when the, the, the graphic memoir really comes alive for a lot of people. It's this almost the entire page very close. She, this is the first time she's had an image like this, and that is what she creates. And so we're drawn in. What will happen? What will happen to Margie? I guess you will find out.